There is more to us than we can see. And oftentimes, adversity and challenge and change that comes into our lives, it brings that out in us. And when we're faced with adversity and challenge and change, my experience has been that those are the things in our lives that shape us and they define our character and they continue to draw that stuff out in us and shows us that we are always bigger than the challenges and adversity that we face in life. And they always show us that there is more in us than we can see. Each one of us goes through that tough stuff with our families, with our health, with our profession, the ups and downs, the different macro environments that affect our marketplace. And what I love about having a, a sense of humor, and even a twisted sense of humor, is that what it allows us to do is it allows us to shift and look and see the world in a different light. And for me, that's really important because you know, for a lot of years, there wasn't anything to laugh at. Sense of humor helps lighten the load and, and see life differently. And, and for me, when I hear laughter, I hear a celebration, I hear hope. Right. For a lot of years in my life, there, there really wasn't anything to laugh at. Um, this is what I look like in 1989. In 1989, I was a homeless person living in the downtown Vancouver East Side. Uh, I lived underneath the Georgia Street Viaduct. I was, um, I was a heroin addict. I came to Calgary and I was speaking to the Alberta Engineers Conference. Now, uh, these, these, this group of people, they build bridges and tunnels and infrastructure. And I was driving up from Calgary and I said to myself, what does a guy who's lived under bridges and tunnels for 10 years of his life say to a group of people that build bridges and tunnels for a living? The uh, best thing I could come up with was, uh, thanks. <laughs> and finally, I said to the guy, you know, I, I cannot have a drink. He said, why can't you have a drink? I said, well, I'm allergic to alcohol. He said, you're allergic to alcohol? Well, what kind of reaction do you have when you drink? I said, I break out in handcuffs. Yeah, true story. I'm half Irish and I'm half Scottish, which means I always want to drink, but I never want to pay for it. <laughs> Anybody here like extreme sports? Raise your hand. Anybody? One, two, yeah. Well, you should try crossing the border with me. <laughs> I was that kind of guy you used to see with the shopping cart. I had dirty hair and yellow teeth and a matted beard dirty clothes and grubby fingernails. I used to go around the downtown east side collecting cans, and that's how I made my way through life. On December the 22nd, 1989, it was the worst day and the best day of my life. I asked them what they'd give me for my boots. And they said, well, you know, we'll give you $10. And so the boots came off. I tell you that it was the worst day and the best day of my life because this was the point where I was finally broken enough to do something different. As I stepped out onto that cold concrete sidewalk and my foot hit that sidewalk and I'd been wearing these socks that I had for like three months and that cold radiated up through my calf and through my leg and it was in that moment when I realized I probably didn't make the best decision I could have today. I remember walking up that block broken, and this was the first time in my life where I had to take accountability of my life. In golf, they have a thing called a mulligan. A mulligan is a do-over, and that's what I wanted. I wanted a shot. I wanted a second chance. I truly did. And I remember that, that rough prayer, if you will. It was, if you help me, yeah, if you... If you do something, I, I don't know what that looks like, but if you, if you open the door even this much, if you just give me a shot, just a sliver, I will run through that door and I will not look back. But I need some help. I need something. Because I obviously can't do this myself. Two weeks later, my mom flew out from Ontario, and she took me back home. I entered into a detox for 10 days, and then I entered into a full-time residential treatment program, and I kept my promise.
Very good. Let's do it again with a little bit of voice inflection, with a little bit of energy, maybe a little body movement. Right? Let's get the blood flowing. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Very good. This is awesome. Okay, turn and turn and face me. Turn and face forward. Good. Now, on the count of three, I want you to say, there's more to me than I can see. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. There sure is. Give yourselves a hand and sit down. I, I needed to take the picture. Uh, my parole officer needs proof of employment, so. Oh, I'm just kidding. I've been off parole for weeks. <laughs> the first decent decision I made was to go back to school. I myself wandering around the campus thinking, boy, is there ever a lot of cans here? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if things don't work out, <laughs> yeah, let's get a buggy. <laughs> After three and a half years in a room about this big with this many people, I walked across this stage and I shook the dean's hand and they said, Joe Roberts, dean's list, academic excellence. I graduated with a 3.94 GPA. Thank you. When we had the interview, Laddie said, in order to be successful in sales, he says, you have to have convictions. <laughs> be the best, but the best that I could be. That I was going to commit and try and learn as much as I could about this this world that I was in. And so I studied and I went to seminars and I read books. After about a year and a half, I left Minolta and I went to another position. And within seven years, I was on the cover of Canadian business as the CEO of a multi-million dollar company. You know, the thing that I, I can't stand the most is when someone says I can't. I can't, I can't. Tell me you don't want to. Tell me you're anxious. Tell me you don't have time. Don't tell me you can't. Tell me you're choosing not to, because I don't believe in I can't. I live in, in a world of possibilities. And not because I read a book and not because I went to a Holiday Inn seminar, but because I lived it. I walked into action. You know, on all these different interviews that I've had over the last 10 or 15 years, they say, well, what's your secret? I say, well, there is no secret. There's small incremental things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, and you commit yourself to change in purpose, and you will find yourself on the other end. But it's really just the trickle approach. But for me, change, change is, maybe I don't get angry today, but I get irritable with change. You know, I go to my bank, and they're trying something new. Woo. And I'm the guinea pig. Right? Or I turn on my computer and it always wants to update something. <laughs> Guess what happens? You click yes and your whole world changes. You spend the next four hours trying to get back to the way it was. There's no rhyme or reason. It's probably better. You know, there's a real upside to homelessness. You know? The upside to homelessness for me for several years was no accountability. Very little is expected of you when you're homeless. When, when I look today at times in my life when I've been disengaged and not accountable, those are the times where I've produced the least and I've been the least happy. I think the irony is that for me, all of the stuff that happened actually created this purpose in my life. And this purpose and idea of sharing a message with people that, that you're absolutely brilliant. For me, it's, it's really about family. And uh, you know, it's funny at our house, um, I'm, uh, I'm not a prophet in my own home. <laughs> and my, my, my wife, Jenny, lets me know that. <laughs> it, it's funny, a few years ago, Jen and I were uh, 
well, we weren't fighting, but we were like, mm, we're grinding a bit. And she, it was Sunday, and she wanted to go to Ikea. And, and in Coquitlam, we have, like, the biggest Ikea in the world. It's like 14 square miles of glue and press board. And um, I, I said, um, no. <laughs> it's Sunday. I'm watching the Philadelphia Eagles beat the New York Giants. I, I, like, I like watching football on Sunday. Not because I like football, because I like doing nothing. <laughs> I don't like going to Ikea. And I just bought this really nice big TV. I don't know if it's my birthday or Christmas or something. And I bought this really nice uh, high-definition fancy. It was one of those TVs that you, you have to have the remote. And so, you know, Jenny's like, come to Ikea. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to go to Ikea. How about I stay here and you go to Ikea? <laughs> and so she said, okay, fine. Fine. So I said, okay, fine. <laughs> so I go downstairs, I get on the treadmill, do my little thing and have my shower and go up and I grab my big box of popcorn and sit down to watch Philadelphia Eagles. Remote's gone. Guess where the remote was? Ikea. <laughs> yeah. And she had her phone off. Yeah. So I watched it on the internet. <laughs> you know, this idea that I'm searching for myself, I think, is a little false. It's not about searching for yourself. It's about acknowledging what was always there and stepping into that. I think that having that personal brilliance and self-esteem shrouded and hidden from me for so many lives robbed me of the opportunity to have a bigger impact. And I think that as each one of us begin to wake up to that brilliance that's inside of us, we go out into the world and we snap off a piece of the macro problem that exists. And we begin to march towards what Maslow called self-actualization. And I think that if each and every one of us do that, we as a species have the ability to solve every problem that we have on this planet. I know that because the first time I had that thought, I was sitting on a park bench in 1989, a homeless skid row bum. He picked up a can and continued his walk. This man I saw today, with dirty hair and layered old clothes, he reeked of dreams decayed. With broken tooth and crackled smile, he mumbled for some change. I passed him by, this man I saw, picking through garbage today. You know, a wrong turn here and a bad choice there can lead the, the best to pain. Such is the fate of some, I guess, to live that life insane. The junkie bum, the wino scum, I have no time today. I'm off to live my life divine. I passed this man today. So off I walked beyond the block and waited for the light. Beside me was a hair salon with mirrors shining bright. I looked at the man in a three-piece suit staring back at me that night. For it was me looking nothing like and I used to fight for back those blocks left years behind before I found the key. I realized the man I saw was nothing more than me. Behind me was a broken man, a man you see now free. Life is grand when you understand there's more to you than what you see. On July 26, 1991, I began a journey searching for the better part of me. And I found it. That's it right there. And I found it thanks to the better part of you. Now you leave here knowing that you are an extraordinary human being and that there's always more in you than you can see. Enjoy the rest of your day.